Welcome to this podcast about Hilton Head Island and the Low Country. In this episode, we are talking with Stu Dawson, one of the original master planners of Sea Pines. Stu will share with us his introduction to Charles Frazier, designing the master plan for Sea Pines, and the development of Harbor Town as we travel down 278 to Lighthouse Road. Before I introduce Mr. Dawson, just an update on the show. We have been downloaded in 32 states across the United States and in six different countries. We appreciate everybody's willingness to share this podcast with their family and friends, and we encourage you to subscribe to the show and continue promoting it so we can continue creating great content. Our guest today is Stu Dawson. Stu Dawson is a principal founder and current principal emeritus of Sasaki, a planning and design firm located in Watertown, Massachusetts. He is an award-winning designer and planner. Projects include urban and waterfront developments, university campuses, museums, resorts, and corporate headquarters across the globe. He has been honored with numerous awards during his career, including the American Society of Landscape Architecture Medal in 1999 and the American Society of Landscape Architecture Design Medal in 2013. That is the highest award given to an individual in the landscape architecture profession. Stu, welcome to the show. Thank you. A pleasure to be here. Stu, in the middle of the 1950s, you are a student at Harvard, and you're also working with Hideo Sasaki, who is a professor at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. You are in the office, the door opens, and in walks Charles Frazier. Please share with us your introduction to Mr. Frazier at that first meeting. Of course. Uh, there were probably only five or six of us in those days. Uh, Sasaki Associates was essentially a, a bunch of graduate students at Harvard that worked nights and weekends. And on one Friday, I happened to be there, thank God, and in walks this brusque uh, young man with a roll of drawings under his arms. And he walks up to Sasaki, no appointment at all. Uh, are you Mr. Sasaki? And of course he was. And uh, Mr. Sasaki said, well, well, what can we do for you? And Charles unrolled his drawings uh, without asking if we had any free time and uh, began by spreading out a survey of what was Hilton Head Island, showing a property, uh, a portion of which was called Sea Pines Plantation. Uh, although he hadn't named it yet. And he said uh, to Hideo, Mr. Sasaki, when I graduated from, my, from Yale, my daddy gave me this property on Hilton Head Island. I'd like for you all to do a master plan for this property. Would you do that? And of course we agreed to do it. And uh, out, out walked Charlie. We had a deal. After that initial meeting, your team did some research, and at Charles' invitation, you traveled to the island. Tell us about that trip. Well, Hideo was um, uh, a little suspicious. I think we were doing mostly campuses and corporate headquarters at that time. We hadn't even thought about doing a resort. Uh, But he said, why don't you go uh, visit Hilton Head and take a look at this property that Mr. Fraser owns on the island. So I uh, booked a flight oh, a couple of weeks later and flew to Hilton Head. And uh, I think I had to fly through Savannah, got on a speedboat, and uh, took off for Hilton Head. I think what was shocking to me was that <laughs> there was no one there <laughs> <laughs> when I got off the boat. There was a pier and a funny old car. And it was a driver that I don't think spoke much English. Uh, but uh, he proceeded to give me a tour, tour and pulled up to where Charles must have kept whatever office space he, he needed uh, for whatever supplies he had. And uh, I, I walked in and said, hello, Mr. Fraser. I'm Stu Dawson. Uh, I'd like to take a look at your island. And he said, sure, let's take a look. Anyway, he gave me a tour, which I'll never forget. Uh, I I couldn't believe the beauty of the island, the simplicity, uh, everything pristine, no bulldozers, no roads, a little dirt path here and there, but a lovely place, lovely, beautiful beaches, 
And uh, I went back to Sasaki and said, my gosh, we better do this master plan. <laughs> this is a great, great site and a great client. I really, I really like Charles. Did you have an impression when you first were getting a tour around the island of, could you even imagine building anything there because of how kind of isolated and, and uh, separated it was from everything else? That's a great question. Uh, I never really thought that. I suppose I was, you know, as a student, so optimistic about everything. I didn't think I didn't think you you couldn't you'd ever be turned back from anything. No, I I just I wondered how to get uh, construction equipment. <laughs> that was my biggest question. Hey, how are we going to build anything? I I can see building, but no, I can't. From your chapter in the book, My Life with Charles Frazier, there seemed to be a good bit of preservationist synergy between the Sasaki team and Frazier's vision, preserving the dunes and beaches and building a master plan that saved much of the natural beauty as possible. Much of that was before there was even environmental laws created. How forward thinking was this plan and vision? I suppose you might say it was a match made in heaven. Uh, Charles Frazier, because of his... uh, interest in uh, nature and, and, and the world in general. And Hideo Sasaki, uh, who believed designers need to have more rational uh, information behind their designer ideas, uh, were, were a perfect pair. The two of them um, spoke the same language. Neither one had to educate the other. It was almost like we didn't really need Sasaki or we didn't need Charles. Either one of them would have been the perfect client. So it was uh, ideal. Uh, oftentimes with a client, of course, you, you tend to be on separate sides of the coin. But in this case, it was a, a natural combination of people who love nature and made every design effort as rational and sensitive as possible. Up to that point, most of the coastal resorts, they'd build a road like right along the ocean front with all the buildings behind it. Uh, you guys did something that was very different. Uh, what was it that you did, and how innovative was that? Again, I think Sasaki, teaching at Harvard, brought in um, consultants from all over the country. And I, I do remember him bringing in uh, a Victor Olge, I think, from... New Jersey, coast, uh, a coastal community, who who had written a book on uh, primary dunes and the importance of preserving primary dunes as as a great barrier against the uh, creeping ocean. And so the the whole planning effort uh, outlined the backside of the primary dune as a limit of, of construction. And we weren't to breach the dunes. We had to stay away from them. So there was a, a whole um, like a scientific cultural side to, to our thinking that led by both Sasaki and Fraser. So again, that consultant, uh, owner, client were in sync. Do you remember where the idea to do cul-de-sacs came from versus running a, a street all along the coast? Well, I think that had to do with um, probably... Uh, and not only scientific, uh, cultural preservation, but also economics, if you think about it. If you were to do a road parallel to the beach, you've got a few homes that have an incredible value, and then they've got, got a lot more that have some value, but not nearly as much. With a cul-de-sac, everyone on the cul-de-sac felt that they had access to the beach because you could walk down uh, the road and walk through a, an easement at the end to get onto the beach. So I, I think it was as much an environmental decision as it was economic. You mentioned in the book that he was a great client but could be difficult to deal with at times. Can you share us some stories of working with Charlie, as you called him? Yeah, well, I think um, difficult it's probably maybe the wrong word. It might be um, uh, a caring, caring client. He cared about everything, so you had to pretty much justify any idea with more than that. And uh, I think I think he was um, uh, 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 he really was a leader of our team. We were we were his draftsmen. 
you've worked with clients around the world on a ver- variety of different projects. Have you ever met anybody? Have you ever had a client that was as passionate about a project as Charles Fraser was? I, I can't think of one. Uh, no, I, no, no, not really. I, I'm sorry about that. There, are, uh, like the mayor of Charleston and the mayor of Boston and other other community leaders that I've dealt with over the years um, uh, have had a similar kind of energy and an intelligence to make sure things happen. And uh, those are, um, I've got, the list isn't long enough, but <laughs> it, it's a good list of, of great, great people, great clients. Charles has to be the number one uh, private sector uh, individual personality, uh, non-public, all private money that I've ever ever met in my life. Did Charles ever share an idea with you that made you think, okay, this guy is just crazy? <laughs> Great question. I think if originally I, I, I had that feeling before I really got to know him. Uh, because when I visited the island for the uh, first time, he had built a kiosk. I think um, I can't describe the location, but within it, he had placed exhibits, including acceptable colors for houses. As long as you used a black roof, you had to um, choose colors from this template. And that uh, when you built your house, you could not build a lawn. You had to leave the natural landscape. Uh, the color of the house had to be subtle, less powerful than the landscape, basically. And they only cultivated lawn on Hilton Head, he, or sea pines, would be the golf courses. And I, I guess I couldn't help but think, you know, growing up in Illinois and knowing the American way, that how could you ever force this down people's throats? I think he did for a while. I'm not sure how long the no grass uh, policy held up. But certainly the colors, the black roof, keep it subtle, were prototypes uh, from then on for me and all of my planning work. Well, I can tell you from all the years that I've been going there, there are lawns and sea pines, but they're very minimal. Uh, most of the, the grass that's there, actually most of it ends up being in the in the backyard towards the marshes and, and that area. You know, it just kind of blends in. But yeah, you don't really see extensive you know, lawns out front of, of properties. That's wonderful. Yeah. And it's, and well, and it's, you know, just from a financial side of it, it's a lot less grass you have to, to have cut. So absolutely. I think the thing, uh, I think what's so brilliant is that um, by saving, saving money, uh, you actually make money, <laughs> and and it's, it's better for the environment. I, I've just thought that I mean, if if I ever thought he was slightly uh, crazy, it might have been the, the the rules he imposed on the the average homeowner. I just loved. Uh, and uh, by the way, the, um, the experiences with Charles, especially that first trip, influenced my uh, professional career. Over the next 50 years, I, I never um, shied away from a, from a bold idea. <laughs> he was a great teacher, too. He has been very well documented as being a great mentor. Many of the people in the book talk about how he mentored them, even after they left Sea Pines. Uh, if they were working for him, he would stay in touch and mentor them as they were doing development projects or whatever they were involved with. So, uh, yeah, he I think he... That was one of the things that I think he really loved to do was just take his his learnings and uh, you know mentor people along and, and help them in their careers. Yeah, very very, um, very accurate. Yeah. How influential was the development of Sea Pines in other developments that came up around the the country? He was very unique at the beginning, and really kind of became a model for a lot of other sustainable uh, developments. I think it was um, a model we almost always used in in our interviews with other with future clients. We hope future clients of of how the uh, client participation was essential, and we hope that uh, whoever was interviewing us would play a similar role, whether it was Dorado Beach in in Puerto Rico or Costa Esmeralda in Sardinia. 
uh, we, um, I think, used the intelligence that we developed at Hilton Head in, in every every move we made. And in fact, most of the uh, clients had been to Hilton Head, so they already knew Sea Pines. And of course, Charles was always nice about giving us uh, credit. He probably scolded us from time to time, but I was never aware of that. <laughs> After that master plan was finished and the development started, you had lost touch with him for a while. You eventually reached out and went to visit Sea Pines to see its progress. How did that visit lead you to working on the plan for Harbor Town? I give all the credit to Hideo Sasaki, my boss. Uh, probably about 10 years after the master plan, he must have read that Sea Pines Plantation was doing great things in, on Hilton Head Island. <clears throat> and that she's do it's, it's kind of a slow time at Sasaki. Uh, the economy's low. Why don't you take a flight to uh, Georgia and, and get over to Hilton Head and visit Charles? Give him a call. So I did, uh, totally uh, on our own. And Charles was, uh, I could tell he was pleased that, that we weren't going to charge a penny. We just wanted to see how Hilton Head was coming along, Sea Pines especially. So I, um, this time I found it easier to get there by boat and uh, met with Charles. And on the second day, he said, let's take it. Let's take a ride around the island. And um, so we did. But he um, drove by the embayment that we had called Harbor Town on our master plan. And he said, how do you guys like to design Harbor Town? I think it's time to design Harbor Town. And of course, I said to myself, well, this is a worthwhile trip. trip. I never expected to land a new job. Uh, I just thought it was for free. Anyway, he hired us to do Harbor Town. And, and uh, that summer, uh, Frank James from our office moved moved to Hilton Head and uh, began doing studies for Harbor Town. And uh, uh, I guess that was uh, one of the, the wisdom of the Dale. And uh, the, I guess you call it the brilliance of Charles Fraser to say, T. Sasaki's right for this. And uh, so we went ahead and um, built, built Harbor Town. What were some of the, the challenges with Harbor Town? Obviously, there wasn't a harbor that actually had to be created. Did you run into things that were extraordinarily challenging about that project? What made it easier than it might have been is that the Corps of Engineers was compliant and peaceful, and the environmental um, waterfront types uh, weren't upset about marsh grasses and uh, eucalyptus trees, and um, we were able to design and build a harbor uh, in an endangered, I guess you'd call it, sensitive area uh, along what was called Calabogie Sound. But, and I think I, it was just one of those good good things. Um, the lighthouse came uh as an idea that I think Charles and I debated who 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 thought of it first, <laughs> Charles or myself. I we never settled that one. But um, as an Illinois boy, I was in love with lighthouses, and he he loved the idea of a lighthouse. So that was almost a fixed uh, from the very beginning. Uh, even though a, lo a lot of people thought we were crazy, but I think that uh, the good news was that permitting was easy in those days. And I think we were what you would consider to be a sensitive uh, consultant and didn't uh, destroy marsh grass where we could save it and save wetlands where we could save them and save live oaks where you could save them and uh, did a good job of mixing uh, construction and, and nature. Now, there was one live oak in Harbor Town that was saved. Charles was very insistent on it. It's called uh, the Liberty Oak. That's uh, where Greg Russell plays his, su that. his summer concerts. We got involved in that. And, and, yeah, I mean, a lot of people were like, what are you doing? You're saving this scrawny tree. And I think it costs close to $50,000 to actually do that. What what happened with that? Tell us that story. Uh, well, you pretty much nailed it. It was a, a last-minute decision a lot of the trees had been removed uh, but none uh, we were good about saving live oak especially uh, they had a longer life uh, than some of the other uh, softwoods but it, it was a curveball but it just turned out that it worked so nicely with the 
curve of the harbor and uh, the nature of the uh, roads. And, and uh, anyway, it was a win-win in the end. But boy, it, 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 it was a costly um, decision. But the idea of the Liberty Oak, Charles always had this dream about uh, the importance of, of liberty and, and uh, history of America. And uh, uh, he wanted Harbor Town and Sea Pines to be connected to a bigger picture than just Carolina. And I think that uh, Liberty Oak had a lot to do with that. There are lots of crazy stories about Charles and how eccentric he was. There are more than a few stories about him getting stuck on sandbars while out sailing with clients and employees. But you had a unique experience with Charles during a car ride. Will you tell us that story? Well, we had just finished construction of the lighthouse, so it was essentially a steel frame with plywood panels, uh, but it hadn't been painted. And uh, Charles was determined to decide how to paint the lighthouse. And so myself, uh, I, don't, I can't remember if it was Jim Light or another one of Charles's uh, partners or right-hand people, and a woman whose name was Elizabeth Gordon, and I'm not sure what role she was playing with Charles, but she was on Hilton Head uh, Sea Pines uh, for a meeting with him anyway. So the four of us got into his uh, car. I can't remember it, Oldsmobile Buick, but it was a, a bigger car, but it wasn't uh, a truck either. Anyway, we were uh, going to drive over to the lighthouse and decide on how to paint it. And I think what was fun is that uh, I ended up wanting to paint it with um, vertical stripes, and Charles and Elizabeth Gordon wanted to do horizontal stripes. And as you probably know, it's horizontal stripes, not vertical. I lost. But what was fun is during the debate, uh, Charles was just driving around and about in the woods adjacent to what uh, what amount of Harbor Town we built and uh, ran headlong into a tree, a live oak. I mean, he wasn't going 60 or anything like this. It was kind of like off-road speed. And, and his passengers go, oh, my God. And Charles didn't say a thing. He just put it in reverse, back kept talking, backed up, and we kept driving. And he never acknowledged that he'd run into a tree. And uh, by the time we got back to the office, uh, steam was coming out from under the hood, and he still wouldn't acknowledge <laughs> he'd bumped into a live oak. <laughs> anyway, I'll never forget that because it, I'd lost my argument about stripes, but I gained a, a, a special affection for the a, ability of a man to focus <laughs> on, on a problem. Anyway, that was a great one. Yeah, to him, it probably uh, never happened. I know, that's right. The lighthouse that we have talked a lot about was known as Fraser's Folly when it was proposed and then even while it was being built, and it was nearly scrapped. Do you know the story behind that? No, I don't. I, I think I, I always, um, I, w I guess I was on the right side of the telephone. I never heard uh, any negative. Charles was so committed to it, and uh, we certainly were. Uh, we, it would be our first lighthouse design ever. So it never occurred to us that there would be um, any kickback, or not kickback, but controversy. So I was never aware of that. Did you have any idea that the first lighthouse that you guys would design was Sasaki would be one of the most recognized lighthouses in the world? <laughs> I know. I know. Uh, for an Illinois boy, that's, that's a thrill. <laughs> it's my understanding that they took all the what they dredged out of the harbor was put along the Calabogie Sound to make the 18th fairway. There was no land there. He wanted to build a golf course and they didn't even have a place to put the 18th hole. Do you know much about that story? I think that's been a little bit exaggerated. Uh, I, I, I know that some of the, the fill was used to, to beef up the 18th green uh, and uh, stabilize that edge of Calabogie Sound. But I don't, I don't think it, was, it wasn't the only source. And the green there was pretty much in our plan from the very beginning. We, we never um, doubted that the lighthouse would be a nice way to end up the 18th hole. How did the Sea Pines Project impact your career and the Sasaki organization? Well, I think it's a um, tremendous impact. I think there are other projects that, that I've been involved with that have an icon uh, level of recognition, but probably none quite match 
uh, the sea pines. Uh, but again, that, that's only useful in, in the resort world. Uh, for my urban clients, they could care less. <laughs> And uh, I think, uh, so it, it was just another wonderful project you could add to your resume and uh, be really proud of it. And it helped, you know, diversification in, in the firm. So we became strong in resort design. Thanks, thanks to Charles and, and Sea Pines. Now, Mr. Fraser came to visit Sasaki for a 30th anniversary celebration. Would you share the story of his visit? Well, I, he was, um, again, I, I'm pretty much a legend in the firm by after 30 years. We were looking forward to the visit, but also realized how um, <laughs> how blunt he could be. We were a little nervous that um, he might have found some flaws in, in, in some of our thinking or our personalities <laughs> or both uh, and would get more of a roasting than a, than a, than a toasting. Anyway, he um, he was uh, just wonderful um, in praising Hideo, and and he told a story about walking in with his his um, gift from his from his daddy, the uh, six thousand acres on on Hilton Head Island, and how he'd roll out the drawings without an appointment, and uh, we sat around and talked, and uh, yeah, he was just really great. And he said, oh, I could I didn't think they could do stuff like this <laughs> anyway. He admitted that no, we needed him and, and, and he needed us. And that was a nice feeling. Charlie, as you called him, suffered an untimely death. If you had one last chance to speak with him, what would you say? I, I think that would be a hard meeting because I know that when he was um, when he passed away in the boat accident, uh, I was in shock. Sasaki was in shock. We thought we'd see him again. We thought we'd have a chance to thank him for giving us <laughs> the, the project in the first place and for being so nice and referencing uh, our skills. I think I, I would have thanked him as the greatest educator I've been exposed to. And uh, the best way to be educated is on the turf and, and on the land, not in a classroom building. And uh, I, I would have said it, you know, Sasaki and and Fraser, those are the two influences in my life. Of course, my mom and dad. I I, I love the guy. One more quickie for you. Sure. I had four of my good, three of my good friends uh, talk me into um, going to Hilton Head Sea Pines uh, for a golf weekend. Uh, I called Charles and said, I've got three three land planners and and myself want to visit your island and. Um, Maybe play Harbor Town Links and you know tour the tour the property. And Shaw said, "Sure, bring him out. I've, I'll I'll arrange for a house for you to stay in." And he did. And uh, so we played Harbor Town Links, and he had invited us to dinner that night, all four of us. And uh, he and Mary and I, a couple of other, maybe Jim Light, were there. At eight, we were done at 7:30 or 8. Charlie was an early eater, and. Uh, we were all set to go to bed. I could tell my buddies were exhausted, but not Charles. Charles uh, clicked into third gear and fourth gear and fifth gear, and we talked until one in the morning. He, he picked our brains. He forced us to daydream. What else? What 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 else would we do at Harbor Town? What else would we do at Sea Pines? Was this the same trip that your one of your friends found the rattlesnake on the golf ball? Oh yeah, on the the seventeenth hole. <laughs> he, um, his ball had gone into the rough, and when he found the ball, it happened to be encircled by a rattlesnake, and he jumped out of the rough and in the, in the middle of the fairway. It had to be a 15-foot horizontal jump. Anyway, we, I was telling Charlie that night, that same night, guess what, Charles? We found a rattlesnake on the 17th hole. And he said, no, he didn't. And that was the end of the conversation. <laughs> he wouldn't say any more. <laughs> it was like the car crash, and it, it didn't exist. <laughs> there, yeah, there are no rattlesnakes on Hilton Head. I, I, I know there aren't. <laughs> <laughs> he, was that, he was that way, though. He's so focused. Stu, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, you're quite welcome. I, I really appreciate the effort you're putting into this. It's really incredible. Charles would be very proud of you. If you enjoy this podcast, I invite you to subscribe and leave us a review. We will see you next time as we travel down 278 to Lighthouse Road.